Good evening. On behalf of the Lafayette Parish Public Education Stakeholders Council, what we call the PESC, I'd like to welcome all of you here in our audience and on live TV this evening. And thank you for joining us for our second Ed Talks, talks centered on education in our community and our state. I'm Jan Swift. I serve as Vice Chair of LAPESC, and I'm representing member organization Upper Lafayette Economic Development Foundation. LAPESC, in case you don't know about us, is a coalition of 13 independent education stakeholder groups with a common commitment to improve overall academic achievement. I'd like to give you a listing of who our members are and thank them all for their service to our community. Acadiana Arts Council, Citizens Action Council, Concerned Citizens for Good Government, the Greater Lafayette Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Southwest Louisiana Black Chamber of Commerce, the Lafayette Parish School System, 100 Black Men of Greater Lafayette, the Lafayette Parish Sheriff's Office, Parents Empowered, the Pew Family Foundation, the State of Greater Black Lafayette, the 705, United Way of Acadiana, UL Lafayette, and Upper Lafayette Economic Development Foundation. Our objectives are to identify any roadblocks to educational attainment for our children, especially those that live in poverty, mostly African American students, and also to advocate for solutions to those barriers and any other barriers in our education system. We value diverse perspectives, shared leadership, open dialogue, and inclusiveness. For more information, please visit the web on our website at LAPESC, it's L-A-P-E-S-C dot com. And also, as you know, we're in the middle of election cycles right now. And back earlier in the year, back in March 2014, nine of our member groups hosted roundtable discussions to get an idea, to listen and learn about what people in our community want to see in our education system. A common thread, or what we call a common vision, that connected different priorities was maximizing each student's achievement and preparedness. All participants stressed that the focus must be on ensuring that students are equipped with the right tools for the future, either through school to career programs, preparing them for the workforce, traditional programs in either a two or four year college or university, or alternative education programs to provide training for those students who might not otherwise get that. In order to find out more about what's in the Common Vision, please visit that website at commonvisionlafayette.org. It's very interesting and it's a great tool that shows that we have so much in common. All of us want the same thing for our children. And before we begin, I do want to say tonight's show is dedicated to all the hardworking teachers in our classrooms. I know some of you are here with us this evening and you suit up every day and work on behalf of our kids. We want to thank you and let you know that we're here supporting your efforts. And now for our program. We're very proud to welcome Hollis Melton, Superintendent of West Feliciana Parish Public Schools, an A school district located 30 minutes north of Baton Rouge. West Feliciana Parish typically ranks in the top 10 school systems in every academic measure. Hollis has been the superintendent for four and a half years in West Feliciana. He has work experience though in rural, suburban, and urban schools as a teacher, administrator, and now as superintendent. He's vice president also of the Louisiana Association of School Superintendents, so he's familiar with some of our successes and challenges that we experience here in Lafayette Parish. He's been married, he says happily, for 20 years to his wife, Nikki, and he has two children, Eli and Anna. Eli is eight in the third grade, and Anna is six in the first grade. So you can see that his whole life revolves around public education with his wife, who's also an educator. To put Hollis's experience in West Feliciana in perspective as to why we asked him to join us this evening, I want to point out that our um, superintendent of schools here in Lafayette Parish, Dr. Pat Cooper, had his first stint as superintendent back about 25 years ago in West Feliciana. And it was in that parish where he developed and administered the first birth to five-year-old early learning program in Louisiana and also began a district-run family health clinic. West Feliciana Parish Schools have been among the highest performing in the state since the start of that program. Hollis continues in this rich tradition in providing a strong and visionary voice. We met through the 2014 Leadership Louisiana class and it was there for the first time that I had the pleasure of, of hearing Hollis's passion for, for providing all of our state's children with the very, very best future, excuse me, by affording each one the very best education. 
And I have to say, his voice echoes the wise words of Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, who said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And I think you'd all agree, our children's futures are in our hands. It's with great pleasure that I present Hollis Milton. Hollis, thank you. Well, first, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you, Jan, for coordinating this great event tonight. And look, any opportunity I can come to Lafayette, enjoy your great food, and enjoy your vibrant city, I'll take full advantage of. It's a wonderful place, and I'm very proud of this city as I think it represents some of the best things that go on in our state. Uh, tonight, I'm here to talk to you about public education transformation. And with public education, transformation in public education, um, I think it's just very important for us all to understand that public education is the bedrock to democracy. It is basically, public education is one of the most important things you can do to bring about change in your city. And when I think of public education, I also think of that it is the fabric of the American dream. If we're going to give students the opportunities and build a bright future, it has to begin with public education. And when I think about quality education, it is tied to the quality of life of not only your parish, but my parish and our entire state. And so I'm very excited about being here tonight. And I think for local public school quality that will determine whether Lafayette continues to prosper, that all communities within Lafayette Parish benefit and flourish in the coming years, and that the children in this parish have a better quality of life than their predecessors, well, that leads me to the quality of public education, which will decide who will live here, who will move here, who will stay in Lafayette. So it's very fun, the learning that goes on in classrooms, but it's very serious business. And again, I also want to thank, uh, like Jan, the teachers that work very hard. And I also want to give a shout out all back to my home district in West Feliciana, because our teachers are putting in a lot of work. And I can tell you right now, some of our teachers are not watching right now, because they're working on lesson plans and grading. And I'd also like to give a shout out to my two children, Eli and Anna. Uh, Eli should be doing homework right now, <laughs> but he's a great multitasker, so he might be able to watch this and, and be able to uh, see me in action. Transformation. You're all here for the, the same reason I am here tonight. You believe, and I believe, we want to see public education improved and transformation to occur in Lafayette and across our state. So as we talk about transformation in public schools, let's recognize that fundamental shifts over time have to take place for trans transformation to occur. Transformation requires change, and it's not so much the what we change, but why we are making changes. And I think that's extremely important to understand. With change, change is precarious. Sometimes change is not a clean process, but if people understand the why, they will push forward and they will persevere. I believe the most important thing that you can do as a community member, as a stakeholder, is to recognize the vision. And I think Jan had spelled out some of the vision tonight. It's not always about you knowing the answers, but rather sometimes it's, it's, you, it's you asking the right questions. Such, how is the vision driving change in our district? How is the vision driving change in our classrooms and in our schools? How are we meeting those student outcomes? Are we looking at data? Are we making progress? Are we looking at anecdotal data where we go into the schools and we see what's happening with students? Does it look different? And wherever we are today, let's not focus on that, but let's focus on the transformational process that brings us about to a brighter future tomorrow. And, and I think that if you can ask those questions, then I think you'll continue to look through the fog to see the light that you will look past the little nuances that happen every day. And remember, at the end of the day, it's about kids and bringing kids to a better outcome. I also would like for you to think about it this way. You need an MVP. You need an MVP. Now, you're thinking MVP, that's a person. No, education's too complex. It takes all of us. The MVP I'm talking about is, is this. The M is for monitor, the V is for vision, the P is for progress. You need to monitor the vision and look for progress. And I think if you can stay focused on that, I think it'll persevere through all of those other things that you see day to day. And then of course, again, that's about the outcomes. So vision, when we talk about vision, um, 
in, in West Louisiana, we have a simple vision statement, and it sounds a little cliche, and I kind of like that it's that way. I like that it's simple, that we say it over and over again and we talk about it, because really what's important is that that vision drive our actions and beliefs. Our vision statement in West Feliciana is to prepare students for college, career, and life in the 21st century. And we start thinking about that vision statement in early childhood. We start thinking about three-year-olds and what it's going to take in a staircase to lead to that vision. So what will we do in, when they're three? What will we do when they're four? What will we do when they hit fourth grade? What will we do when they hit ninth grade that will lead them so that when they leave our school system, they are ready for college, that they have the skill sets, that if they're going right into the workforce, they're ready for that. And all kids need to be prepared for life. And we see that as a, it, we're an instrumental player in that. So when I think of early childhood, I want to mention that right now because that is a what. So if the why is our vision, prepare students for college, career, and life in the 21st century, one of the activities, one of the processes, one of the pieces that are big in our plan that we have a, a fundamental responsibility we feel like in our district is, is to support early childhood. And because we know if we focus there, we'll have our students ready for when they get to kindergarten if we focus on the early childhood part. And again, that staircase is already being built. We've had so much success in our district with early childhood because of a focus that we rank first in an independent study by LSU and Tulane for kindergarten readiness. And quite frankly, we're very humble. We're humble about our work, but we weren't surprised about being first because we focus on it. We know where our kids are coming in at three-year-old, three-year-old, as three-year-olds, and we know what we may need to do. Universal pre-K, we offer pre-K to all of our students in our parish. My two children benefited from universal pre-K. As a matter of fact, they blossomed. And when they got to kindergarten, they were already ready for that transition to kindergarten readiness and those high academic standards that begin to take fold. But it is about having quality, and we're very fortunate to have a quality early childhood program. And while I speak on early childhood tonight, I need to mention that Superintendent Pat Cooper, as it was said, was instrumental in his work to develop our early childhood program over 20 years ago. I think it's around 25 years ago. I was probably in middle school, to give you, <laughs> give you an idea of how long ago that's been. But what that tells you is that program, the vision was right for it because it's still there today. And it's sustainable. And it's at the heart of our community. Our community knows and values what that early childhood <laughs> program means. So again, when I think about transformation, early childhood is a good example of transformation in public schools. And once your imagination stretched about how good a program can be and how it can help children, you're not going to take it away. And we support it uh, very much in our district, and we'll do anything to keep that strong program. So I want to thank you, uh, Superintendent Cooper. Uh, you've done some amazing work in West Feliciana, despite the fact that I was in middle school. So. So vision, when we think about stakeholders, I'd like for you, you know, we talk about a collaborative vision and all of you have worked on this collaborative vision and, and I've read it and I think it's a powerful tool to help guide you. And, and I want to remind you of some maybe the simple um, things to think about about your vision and maybe I hope that this will help you tonight. And in part, I missed this part when I first started, you know, my goal to, here tonight is just to in, inspire you to continue to support public education and to inspire you or to encourage you to continue to keep the focus on the direction of your school system. I think those are key instrumental things that, that community members need to do so that we can see through the fog. So when I think about stakeholders, obviously the most important stakeholders affected by this vision is parents and students, teachers and principals, because they're there every day working through it. So when I think about parents, I think parents want three basic things in that vision and somehow you connect that with them. I think parents want, and I say this because of research, and I also apologize because there's probably some parent out there who's going to say, well, that's not what I want. Well, I understand that, but the pattern is most parents want these things. Uh, the pattern is, is this. Parents want a safe environment. They want an environment that's conducive to learning and that's positive, and they want a caring a teacher and a caring principal to help them meet their potential. If you can do those things, for the most part, a parent's happy. And they're happy with the vision, but they need to see that vision take place in that classroom and how it directly impacts them. So I think that's the key piece. And I think if you can remember that in your transformation as you continue to work through your vision to keep that at heart. The community. 
You know, um, Nelson Mandela once said, a good head and a good heart is a formidable combination. And I think his point is, is that it's great to have students who know all of these great things, but if their heart's not in the right place, we're probably missing something. When I think of community members and, and pastors and other groups that represent the larger community, the thing that I find over and over, what they're very interested in, they want students to have all the achievement, academic skills, like all of us, but they also want them to be good citizens. And I want to commend you in the Acadiana region because I know your United Way is doing some great work with your schools, particularly with the Leader in Me program. Uh, in West Feliciana, we're also doing some work in that program as well. And the Leader in Me program, and I, and I dislike calling it a program because I'm not crazy about programs. It's really about cultural transformation. It teaches kids the seven habits of highly effective people. We start teaching our kids at four, and now we're starting to teach them even at three. What does it mean to be proactive? And let me tell you, if you think kids can't learn this, my little boy is a great example of this. Instead of debating with him about doing his homework, I constantly remind him, Eli, okay, I know you want to go outside just like me. He's my boy and rather play than do his homework, I ask him, Eli, what is the proactive thing to do? And he will take ownership and go, I need to go do my homework. I say, thank you, Eli. And I think it works for all kids. The seven habits of highly effective people we teach, and I know United Way is, is doing some work with you guys in the Acadiana region, and you're doing a great job because you have some lighthouse schools around, and I know you're continuing to, to develop that program. I think that builds within our vision, and that's why we chose to do it, we're preparing students for college, career, and life. These habit skills are good habits to build for kids so that they're prepared for life. But I think you're doing it within your vision statement as well. The business community. The business community is the consumers of our product. That's our students. And so the business community, I, I, I really think right now, wants us to continue our work to be comprehensive schools. Basically help kids, if they're going to college, to be readily prepared to go to college and persist through college. But they also want those kids to have experiences that if they go into the workplace, that they have some industry-based certificates, that they have some previous knowledge of what might make them successful and give them ideas to move right into the workforce and the transition be a little easier than it has been in the past. But there's also something else that I find that I collect a lot from the business community, and I think the research speaks it. Uh, the business community wants us to teach our kids soft skills. They want students to be able to communicate by looking you in the eye, to be able to articulate and express and understand customer service. And they also want students to be able to collaborate, to be able to work together to solve problems. Because therefore, when these kids get out, we're going to expect them to do those things. They also want them to be critical thinkers. And I think the transformation that, that you guys are under and that we're under, that we continue to work at, and we've, we've made a lot of progress, and I'm sure you have too, is that the instructional design has to change in order to prepare students for this 21st century that requires on these skills. So we're going from more of a lecture-based instructional project process to basically a project-based learning process, where students get to work together to solve problems and to go deeper into the content. And when we look at the new rigorous standards that we're all implementing in our state, those rigorous standards really require an instructional process that looks different from a traditional, uh, a traditional way of teaching school that maybe many of you and myself experienced as we were kids. I think we need to continue to work on that because of this too. We need to continue to work on helping our kids work through project-based learning because that's more STEM-centric curriculum. So what is STEM? science, technology, engineering, math. Why should we be working on this? Well, the largest growing sector of jobs in Louisiana and across our nation is STEM jobs, okay? Jobs in those fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. They're also the highest paying jobs. I think of it as a win-win when I go home and I'm working with my kids and they're getting excited about project-based learning, working in the STEM areas, because some of them, I think, are going to take a future in that route. By the way, they'll have good job stability and also they'll have a high salary and I think that's great opportunity for our kids and for the kids here and across our state. Technology. You know we all have iPhones or some kind of phone today. I got mine with me. I don't know how to disconnect from it, right? Some of you probably have the same situation. I think technology has been sort of uh, the area that we really need to continue to work to integrate technology in our curriculum instruction assessment. We do that a lot in West Feliciana. Our West Feliciana Middle School is a one-to-one -one school, meaning all of our students have, have a tablet, basically an iPad. 
One of the reasons we do that, well, it fits within our vision. We're preparing students for college, career, and life in the 21st century. Walk around in the workforce today or anywhere you go, and everybody has this device in your hand. And this device is really changing how we might look at education as well. And what I really like about our, our one-to-one -one initiative and the technology initiatives that we're working on is that technology allows us to teach students when the bell rings at the end of the day. So learning can go on way beyond the traditional school day. It can also be a personal notebook and the new textbook. And it also breaks down the barriers of the four walls. We can connect to the world now and not have a classroom be a silo because we want a classroom to be relevant and we want it to look like the workplace. And all of you know when you go out in the workplace, everybody's got probably four devices now. It's amazing what we carry with us. And so the other thing about technology too, let me just add a few other things. It makes, it, it makes education more relevant. It can personalize. It helps kids expand on creativity, increases communication skills. So I think that any way we go, we've got to continually embrace this world and move further and further into it for our kids so that they are truly prepared for the 21st century. And you know, in my humble opinion, a lot of this transformation around the vision and what, what we're seeing does not have to be adversarial. I think it just takes us all going back to the well and asking ourselves, are our beliefs, are our actions, are our opinions aligned with the vision statement? Because if they're aligned with the vision statement, then I think we all have to take a pause if we're doing something that's inconsistent with that vision statement. And that's what I try to remind myself and what I ask folks around me, that if we're working toward the vision statement, that we need to continue to stay focused on that and continue to move forward. Early childhood, I'll go ahead and reiterate this one more time because it is a true transformation piece. I, you know, in our state, our state, and I don't know what your poverty level that you serve here, but in our state, we serve about 70% of the kids who walk into a public school come from poverty. And as you stated, poverty is a great barrier to learning. And so for us, the way I look at this, that's a challenge, but it's a challenge that we can overcome. But the only way we can overcome it is an investment in early childhood. And the way I see this is, is now with standards that are going to be compared across the nation, to set ourselves up for success and to be more competitive, if we offer this investment in early childhood, our kids will be able to compete on the academic level across the United States. And the faster we move toward that transformation to have an early childhood programs across all districts, the better the state of Louisiana is going to be because we're going to get a leg up for the first time against our counterparts because there's a lot of other states that aren't making that investment yet. And I can just tell you simply, if I give a kid 180 days, okay, 180 days of school called pre-K, they're going to outperform all the kids that didn't get it, even if they have the barrier of poverty. I can even prove it with them own district. We've been recognized by standards and poors for closing the achievement gap in West Feliciana Parish. And part of it is it's strong, good teachers, working very hard, and all of those other things that are key fundamentals. But when you have kids that get 180 extra days of instruction, you're going to be successful. And you know what that's going to mean for you? You're doing it the efficient return on investment model. If I make an investment early childhood, I'm not spending as much time in remediation. I'm improving teacher morale because teachers aren't finding kids that are so far behind because we're unlocking some of the learning issues at the early ages. We're also making it a smoother transition for families. So uh, you name it, graduation rate, college rate, all of those things improve with early childhood and the research backs that across the nation and we are a good place to come visit West Feliciana and I'd be glad to take anyone on a tour because rigorous pre-K is a key process uh, universal pre-K is a key process that can help you in your district as well as other districts out there. So I want to give you a personal story about pre-K, about a child I know, uh, Ty. Ty was in pre-K, uh, and I'm naming this child Ty, uh, with my daughter. Uh, and when he started pre-K, the teacher was really struggling. Ty did not know his colors or shapes, had trouble identifying his name. So immediately the teacher was struggling, started working with her team of teachers, and they had him screened. He had a language delay. They addressed the language delay early on, and they kept the rigorous curriculum. They gave him intervention. They kept him after school. And guess what? He started kindergarten ready. He was on the same level as everyone else. Now he's in first grade. Into the first nine weeks, he's on the honor roll. 
Now this is a kid who had the social skills. He was ready for that. But when we tied in the academic and we found out the place he was, now he's very successful. And I think his trajectory in life has changed. And you know what? It's transformational not only for the child, but for the mother. The mother did not have a successful school experience. And if we had let this child start to struggle early on, what trust would we have had with that parent? What buy-in? Now the mom's our biggest cheerleader. She's up at the school. She wants to help. She knows what we've done for Ty. And it has changed her mindset, paradigm, about her, about her life and how she relates to school. So those are some powerful stories, and we have plenty of them in West Feliciana. And I think anywhere that invests in early childhood, you will see that. So from a great transformational leader, I'd like to leave you with a quote from one of the greatest transform transformational leaders in our history and just give you a, a couple comments to think on and then any questions. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. That's from Martin Luther King Jr. And you think about the transformation that he worked our society to and did it fairly quickly, remarkably. So when you think about the vision and the transformational process that you need, that we need in education, if, if you could do a few things as stakeholders. First of all, be supportive of the vision and not cynical. Stay calm. Don't have anxiety. And, at, and above all else, keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Thank you. I don't know you. Uh, Hollis, good to see you. I, I have a see. question. You know, one of the, the great things that happened uh, fairly recently was our newspaper, The Advertiser, uh, brought the superintendents together uh, for a luncheon. And uh, I asked the question, you know, if there's one thing you'd like to change um, or to improve your school districts, what would it be uh, on a statewide basis? And they all agreed with you that it was pre-K education. Um, and I very much agree with that. What I didn't ask, and the, the second question, if I had been given the second question, that I'd like to ask is the one I want to ask you, which is, uh, what do you think is being overhyped as, a, as something that will solve the problems or you know, create the great, you know, is there something that's being overhyped, uh, either in the media or through the educational establishment, that uh, you know, we need to be more wary of and, and, and instead focus, let's say, on pre-K education? Yeah, and, and, and I'll take it from this point. I, so I want to be very careful when I say this. I don't know that sometimes it's necessarily things are overhyped, but, but we move sometimes through fads in education, and we jump on the bandwagon, and maybe it works, but have we really thought of, does it fit and align with our vision? Is it even sustainable? And truly, does it have the impact that you're asking for? Um, so let, let, me, let me pick away at one, that's, that's, but I want you to know I'm not anti this, I'm not pro this. Charter schools. Charter schools are talked about as, as maybe a, a panacea sometimes. And my concern about that is, is that I'm not anti-charter. I think districts have to use charters if they feel like that meets their vision statement. And if a charter can do things that a traditional school can't do, at the end of the day it has to be about the kids and student outcomes. So go with the charter. But I also know that charters, just by the name virtue of charter, and if it doesn't fit with your vision, might not be the right choice. And I think there are numerous things. I'm using that as an example, but I think there's other ones. We could name compass evaluation, the teacher evaluation. I think there's some really good things in the teacher evaluation if you use it correctly and you really work with your teachers to have good understanding. But it in itself isn't going to transform public education. And I think sometimes that's been so, well, if we just do this, every, all the kids are going to just be geniuses. Well, it, it doesn't happen that way. And education is a very complex process. And a big key piece of anything is getting buy-in and getting people to understand the why. They can understand, hey, we're going through a new evaluation because we, we, want, we want teachers to really work hard at growing in this area. And we're going to support you and provide professional development. And then we're going to evaluate. Compass evaluation can work. Uh, if we just put it out there very quick and fast and not explain the why, then it, it can create problems. So I hope I answered that. Good to see you, by the way. Very good to see you. Alice, I have a question. Um, all the good things that happen in West Feliciana, the Leader in Me program, 
uh, universal pre-K or you know birth to five-year-old. How are you guys paying for all that? Sure, sure. We look at funding issues here, and we've had some challenges and getting past this tax. I know this isn't free. Sure, sure. For us, our, our pre-K program is paid for by our local taxpayers, okay? So I want to be very open with that. But I'd also say this to you, um, because everybody's going to have a funding model. And, and I hear that all the time. We'll hear, oh, this district has this, or this district has that. And my continued question to my district is, is this, is say, if this is our vision statement, then what are our priorities? And our priorities in a budget line whatever is most important ought to come to the top and whatever is most important that has the impact on kids ought to drive that budget in a strategic planning way. So we really, we protect universal pre-K and we've had to make tough decisions. Uh, we've had to make tough decisions since I've been there in four and a half years. We had to close the school. But the one area we did not touch, which was no mandate, was universal pre-K. And the board felt like they knew me. There were no sacred cows except for maybe one. I was not going to touch universal pre-K because I knew what it did for kids and I knew it elevated the boats and I, of all of our kids and I also knew it was committed to our vision statement. So I think, which is tough, tough work to do, but really asking yourself, if this is the pot of money we have for good, bad, or worse, in good times or bad, or however you're going to look at it as a community, then what are our priorities? And if we've got to cut some places, let's look at the things that have less of an impact and let's protect the things that have the most impact. As a superintendent, if you were going into a school district where there were significant numbers of low-performing, high-value schools, um, would you start with the premise that all children can learn, no matter their race, income, or zip code, and that all children do value education, and so do their parents, no matter their race, income, or zip code? Yes, sir, and I think you have to have the belief before you do anything else. I think even building leadership programs uh, you have to have a belief in the, in the children in front of you that they can rise above and live whatever life. And I think you have to hire people who believe what you believe. And I do agree, and I know you do great work with leadership and Boy Scouts, because I heard a wonderful story about you doing that work with kids. And I love that kind of work. I think that's remarkable. And the power that you do there benefits the school system so much. So thank you, because when those kids are in school and all the learning that they're taking in leadership and persistence, that's going to pay huge dividends for those kids. But I do agree with you. You have to have a belief system that is bought in by every single employee in that school, that they believe that, hey, these kids can achieve. There may be some barriers. There may be some poverty or some resources that are lacking. But again, we can't admire problems. We can't just look at a problem and go, well, that's just a problem. We've got to look at it and go, okay, strategically, how do we work around it? How do we help a child if they're struggling? And that's the one reason why I'm such an advocate for early childhood, because sometimes if we can, if we can work with families who may not have resources and we can get those kids in early ages, they're going to fly in time. we just got to get them early enough to identify certain things so that they can be successful. What's your first student spending? Uh, your uh, per student spending is about ten thousand five hundred approximately. Okay, so so when you look at that, uh, we typically rank probably in about the top ten in our state. Uh, to be very fair, uh, because people will ask me that question. That includes operating and capital. Yes, sir. Thomas, would you discuss to the? Um the demographics of your school district, not necessarily race or from gender or whatever, but I know you have a very low percentage of private schools in sure. the West Felicia and Parish. Sure. And, 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 and I will uh, start this off with to say that we want to be the choice for all of our kids. And I think that's a key vision piece that you want. You want to be the school of choice. Uh, we're very fortunate that about 95% of our students in our parish uh, claim us as the choice uh, for them. Uh, we, we set demographically, we're about 52% poverty. Um, uh, from from a, a racial standpoint, we're about 55% white, 45% African American. Uh, we, we, have a, we, we don't have a large number of ESL students, not yet. I think we're going to continue to see that increase. I know you're experiencing that. But in the rural area, we just don't have, uh, we might have 1%, 2% Hispanic if I, if, I, if I really looked at the numbers closely. Sir. Um, the business community has been chastised by 
a segment of the local population on um, sticking our noses into education. Uh, in a blog that I read just this week, um, it was suggested that uh, if we really wanted to do something about education, that we should improve the economic achievement gap in the state and get the state's the economy off the bottom across the nation, and that somehow or another by doing that, education would follow. Um, whereas our position, I guess, has been that we really do want to improve the economic achievement gap, but to do that, we've really got to improve the educational outcomes of our kids in order to improve the, the, the economics. Just your thoughts. You gotta teach a man to fish and, uh, and help with that. And it's not to say that there aren't issues there. Um, and, and look, and I've been an educator in very urban schools. I've taught in New Orleans, okay? So I, I know some of the challenges that are out there, especially when students come from some very, very deprived areas economically, okay? I, I, I get that. Uh, I, I'd also think, though, the most powerful thing that, that, that you would hope that people, all people would do is to say, hey, look, we, we all can see there's an issue here if kids aren't achieving. And we all want kids to achieve. So why don't we come together and figure this thing out? Because if you take a city like yours, Lafayette, with your rich culture, your food, festivals, and your university, okay, and you do some exponential transformational work in the public school system, do you know how bright your future will be? You might be the greatest city in the United States. So you know what the problem is. You all know you got to get your hands dirty and get, it, get, in, get into the environment. Stay focused on that vision, though. And try not to let people respectfully tear you apart. I think it's great that the business community is involved and has a focus. Why wouldn't they be? I think it's great if you got pastors involved. I think, look, the more people you can get involved, <laughs> That's what you want. And I think for teachers, sometimes teachers, one of the challenging part for them, they feel like they go to work and they feel like they have a lot of obstacles and they don't feel like they've got those people behind them helping them. And so I think, I think there's probably communication gaps more than anything else, but if the business community can say, really, at the end of the day, we want what you want. We might look at it from a little different angle. We might look at it more at numbers or what have you. But at the end of the day, we pretty much want the same thing. Why don't we find the areas we agree on first and then maybe we'll come around to some things about maybe what we don't agree on. And I think that might help, you know, teachers and, and others feel more supported. It's worth it. It's worth a try. Could you discuss the LSU partnership that you have with the um, leadership training? Okay. First of all, we do have teachers that, uh, we have students that come to ULL, we like that, and we have teachers that come from ULL too. So I have to say that for the Raging Cajuns as well as other places, all right? I, I know what territory I am in. Um, LSU, uh, the Kane Center, uh, we've worked very hard on a partnership with the Kane Center. The Kane Center primarily works in STEM areas. And uh, through this ongoing partnership, working on some of the standards in math with, with Common Core and all of that, uh, we've had we've had great professional development experiences. So there was an opportunity with a Believe and Prepare uh, grant that came about from the State Department. We were very intrigued by this work, and so was LSU. So we talked to them about building a residency model for teachers. Because if you ask uh, any teacher, including myself, what was the toughest year, and they're typically going to say, easy, it was number uno. It was one. I really didn't know everything I needed to know. I, I was trained and I had all these great teachers in college, but I got out there and I got bumped around. And what we know, we lose a lot of teachers because of that. And if we could build a residency model where a teacher would stay with us for a year, work under a mentor, and slowly but surely let them see all of it. Because one of the things, and I am not here to knock student teaching, I think student teaching is a good process. I'm saying what may make student teaching better, whether it be a residency model or not, Student, as teachers, two of the most important er times of the year student teachers miss, the beginning of school and the end, because it's how you begin and end that really decides your success. Well, with our residents, we brought them in to see all the staff development and what we were trying to do, working through a school improvement plan, all those other things that you do that sometimes student teachers don't even know, you know, that happen. And then uh, we let them start off at the beginning to really see how do you set up a class to have expectations. How do you deal with those first few days, which are, which are very difficult for teachers? Through that process, what's been really good for us, which is a win, we're building a residency model. And primarily, we chose STEM areas. Why? Because to get 
uh, science and math teachers at the high school level is just a complete challenge and we have a shortage in our state. So uh, we do fairly well being right outside of Baton Rouge, but we know that we could still, we'd like to have a larger pool to choose from and, and so would other districts. So we chose the STEM areas. What that's doing for our students, it's offering our students college credit for where these residencies are set up in our school. So we're working on a process and we're very close to getting there to where every student at West Feliciana High School that wants it will gain up to 30 hours of college credit from LSU. I know that makes parents happy. And it makes me very happy too. So, so uh, but, but it's exciting work and I appreciate you mentioning that. The Believe and Prepare uh, partnership with LSU, uh, we're very excited and we're gonna continue to work through that. And you know, it, for us, what really, really is fun in my district is the curiosity and the inspiration. We, we're just, our vision statement just continually makes us curious about what we knew next. And we're having a lot of fun. Can you explain to us uh, the governor's model in West Louisiana parents as it relates to the role of the school board and the role of the superintendent? Okay, so I think the biggest shift that we've experienced through the legislation, uh, I think primarily Act 1 through the governor, is that the superintendent uh, hires and fires and has primarily control over that now, and that the, the board, in my understanding, okay, and I'm not you know, from way way we interpret it, the board has still has control over policy, voting on that, and they and they still have a very very strong uh, power over budget. So sometimes though the the gray area is, and and you, you we all experience it across the state. It does happen. Is well, what is when you hire somebody that is a funding allocation. So in some ways they can kind of intermingle. Uh, so my understanding though, just to separate them. Hiring and firing, more personnel items, directly superintendent, budget and policy still board. But that's a huge shift. That's been a huge shift. Have you embraced it? Yeah, we, we, well, look, let me tell you, we've just been fortunate. Uh, our board has. I won't say it's been easy. It, 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 it has been some, even sometimes hard to explain to constituents in the community who feel like, well, it was the old way. And, and that's kind of hard for them. But but I think they've learned it and I think they've learned to adapt. I'm never going to say it's easy because anytime you make a major shift like that, you're always going to run into some challenges. But yeah, so far so good. And I, I, I will say that um, I'm, I'm very appreciative of my board and, and uh, I'm appreciative they were fine with me coming tonight, you know, and, and, and I'm thankful for that. Um, with your program being based around STEM as your lead focus, I was wondering in what way or how do you make sure that you're still infusing the arts into your school programs? Because having also taught in New Orleans, you know, the band particularly provides opportunities for a lot of students to go on to college that may not otherwise have that opportunity. Yeah, it's a great question. Really, what we're, so I'm smiling. One of our things as we move forward is going to be STEAM. So that A is art, okay? So STEAM. But you got to get to STEM before you get to STEAM, maybe. But I'll tell you this, just, just kind of unique. Uh, as a matter of fact, they will start with us next week. We're going to do a lot more artwork at our lower elementary school, which we haven't had before. And we've had some challenges financially trying to do those things, but I'm a big believer in the arts. I believe that you have to have it. It's just a part of the whole child. It inspires kids, and it gives kids engagement. Um, my child, Eli, I'm a little biased. He's talented in art. I have no idea where he got that from, but... He seems to have a talent for it. And so I'm a big believer because I know what it does for his self-esteem and his involvement in school. So as we build this out, I, and, and, I, and I'll mention this to you, I, I kind of believe that, that really what we're looking at is, is a STEM-centric curriculum, which just really means more project-based learning. Now some of it because technology is the new wave and we're trying to you know, get kids excited about the STEM areas because that's where a lot of jobs are. We are putting a little bit more focus there, but it, but it but I don't want it to ever become adversarial to say, well, we're not going to do the same in art. And as a matter of fact, I think when we're really hitting the home run ball is, is that when we're doing this project-based learning and the kid who can work in that group, who can draw out the science project or whatever it might be, well, what, you know, what an incredible value to recognize all kids' talent in that classroom. So during your tenure at the West Louisiana, uh, were there any challenge schools or failing schools or struggling schools and if so what type of turnaround plans did you put in place? Sure. No sir, not in West Fleet Shannon but I did work in uh, EBR. I was a, a principal, assistant principal, a dean, 
and a teacher, and I worked at different schools. I worked at some of the high-performing schools. I helped work on developing a magnet, and I also worked at some of the, the low-performing schools too. And, uh, and, and I can tell you, you know, working in the low-performing schools, one of the things that I found that was just key essential, and it does come down to funding, those kids need more time, okay? If you think about early childhood, all I'm saying is all kids need, you know, all kids can benefit from more time, and some kids who struggle need more time. I'm just giving it to them at the earliest ages so they don't run up into middle school and be struggling, which would create a low-performing school. However, in Baton Rouge, we, we did not have that. So what we did is, is we made sure that we tried to find ways to, to have interventions during the day. We also tried to find ways to offer after-school tutoring. And we just tried to really keep a focus on where our kids were and where they needed to be. And I think that's the big piece, if you can just stay focused on that. But y'all, there's no panacea for it. I think you gotta support teachers, recognize the hard work they're doing, and continually to look at the data and say, are we where we need to be? How do we continue to move kids up? And we still use all those processes in West Feliciana. It doesn't really, what's surprising sometimes people will ask me, well being in a high performing district, do you do, do the low performing districts do a lot of the things that you do or vice versa? And I'm like, yeah, we really do. We still pull kids for intervention. We still do all of those things because that's what you do for kids. If they're not meeting the standard, they're not gonna magically get it. The only way we can get it is to give them more time. So I have run, worked on those turnaround programs and I, and I could even say this, I'm proud to say this, that one of the schools in Baton Rouge, one of the, one of, it was a, uh, uh, historically low performing schools, one of the last times it had great performance was when I was there. But I can tell you this, I wasn't the M MVP. It was just a group of people working together, looking at data, looking at where kids are and staying focused on how do we get these kids to learn the next thing they need to know. I want to throw in this too. It, when you look at low performing schools, please keep this in mind. I think sometimes, and I think we are because we're a society that wants this, and believe me, I'm a part of this, okay? I, so I understand it. But I want to say this to you. you, you typically, most schools don't get into a low performing place overnight, so you don't get them out overnight. And I think sometimes we, we jump in immediately and say, well, we're going to fix this school tomorrow. Guys, I would love to say that I had the same sense of urgency because I don't want to see any kid in there fail. Okay, I don't. But I also know a lot of things that are systemic that you want to see sustainable. So when you, when you come back in 10 years, kind of like early childhood, if it's done right and you just stay focused on it, through time it's going to take you where you need to be. And if you push too hard too fast sometimes, too much change on top of change sometimes just, just kills an organization and kills morale. So just be real careful with that because I, I know what's out there sometimes and I see that and I can tell you any of the schools that I worked at that improved, it took time to do it. No matter how hard we tried, it just, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a cultural change. It's a lot of inventions. You gotta really work with parents to get them invested, involved and you don't do that with, you know, there's no panacea. few minutes left so we're not shutting down the program but I'd like to take this opportunity to invite Dr. Pat Cooper to come up and join Hollis. Um, one of the things that really strikes me is that the seeds that were planted back 25 years ago in West Feliciana you're seeing the the benefit of, of uh, the time and energy sure. that a visionary had and so I thought we just have you know I think about six minutes I've got a timer that I'd forgotten up here but if y'all could just have a seat and maybe if there's anything you'd like to discuss together, I just really feel honored to have both of you here with us this evening. So. Well, I think I think you should all be honored to to have the superintendent here. Um, it's hard sometimes to start programs, but one of the one of the harder things to do is to come into a program that's kind of successful and not think that you have to change it all, but but that you can make it even more successful. And I think that's one of the things that that has happened in in West Louisiana. The program they have now. Is, is far better than, than what we had 20 or 25 years ago, although it's hard for me to remember what, what we had. <laughs> but, um, but I think that's, that's very commendable. And, and, um, and I think the other thing that you said that was, that was interesting, and it's the thing that we're working on here, um, we've, we've had um, poor performing schools in Lafayette for a long, long, long time. And people are just tired of it, and I'm tired of it. Um, but one of the things that we have in the turnaround plan is this 
this plan. It's a six-year plan to try to get us to be this A school district. And, um, and I think people do get um, a little anxious about that, that, that um, you know, we, we need to hurry up, we need to hurry up. But if you hurry up, you, you're going to screw the whole thing up. Uh, now, one of the things that is legitimate is we've got to get started on it. And, um, and part of our problem here um, that you know as a superintendent, I know as a superintendent, we can't moan and groan about it. We just have to figure out a way to get around it. Is we, we sometimes think we don't have sufficient funding and, uh, and maybe not a, enough support from the school board. Um, a lot of that comes from the Act 1 and all those things. But, but I think what we have is, a, is an absolutely incredible community that wants good things to happen. And, um, and if it doesn't happen, it won't be the community's fault because I think they are right there. Um, um, I still remember the small chamber of commerce building in, in West Louisiana, but, uh, but I still remember all the support they gave us because they were very proud of, of what they had. I think you'd, uh, you'd be commended for continuing those things and making them even better. The other thing that intrigued me, and then I'm going to hush for a second because I'm really interested in your, in your leadership program with LSU because that's something that we talked about this very day with a group of our black leadership here in Lafayette of how, how can we get more leaders in general, but especially more African-American leadership, because that just bodes well for our African-American children. They've got to see role models. And so we've got to step up to the plate with UL, I think, and see what they can do. You know, if you put that challenge out there to UL and say, LSU has this, why don't y'all have it? <laughs> Sometimes that works. <laughs> Competition, competition. No, no, and I appreciate you saying that. I think that is something across the state that we do see. Sometimes we see a shortage, especially in the ranks for, for African American teachers and leaders. And, and, and we struggle with that as well in West Louisiana. And we're working hard. We're trying to, trying to improve. And we have increased our, our, our numbers of African Americans in, in, in the teaching pool ranks. And we're very proud of that. But we're not where we need to be yet. And, you know, and, and I just, I, I think we have a good plan and I keep reminding everyone we have the vision, we have the belief we can do it and we're showing good progress but it's almost like school sometimes everybody wants you to be at that final place very quickly and we look I I have that same sense of urgency why you're a superintendent why I am too you want things to change like yesterday uh, but with humility you you have to just keep working at it and knowing if I can get a step ahead today, a step ahead tomorrow, and I just keep making this progress, keep moving the ball forward, so to speak, we'll get there. And, and that's what, I, what I've what i told my community, and we're, we're gonna work on that, and we're gonna get there. Yeah. And I know y'all are very database like we are. You know, I'm sure all your schools have data rooms and all that kind of stuff. So uh, in Louisiana, you can't really operate or think you're operating a decent school district if you don't do those kind of things. But I know that, that if you could just talk a little bit about that, because I think it'd be interesting how y'all keep up with your data. And you know, we, we have a, a structure here where we've got we've got the 40 schools, and every one of them has an instructional strategist, and, and some of them have data managers. Because it takes it takes manpower to pull all that stuff together, and then to explain it to the teachers. Sure, sure. And and I'll tell you, uh, we work on a professional learning community model, a Rick Do Four model. And we've had a lot of success with that. Um, we've, we've given uh, some videos to the state to take a look at how we do it. Um, and so basically we use, we use several formative assessment programs because what we want is we want to make sure that we're formative in nature. Just getting an end of the year state test is really an autopsy. It's too late. There's not a lot you can do about it. Either the kid achieved or didn't achieve. And, and typically some of that data is hard to disaggregate even where they were successful or not. You know in the big subject area, but sometimes knowing specifically what, what hurt that child or you don't have. What we really try to do is work on benchmark assessments to do that. That is a work in progress. It's going to take us quite a while. We're, we're, we're fairly successful at it, but also with the test changing, that's a huge struggle with us right now. How do we adapt to the new test? Yeah, I think we're all facing that. And one of the things our teachers say a lot is just so much testing, but, but a lot of that we can't do anything about. It's, it's what's brought on by the state. Uh, so we try to use it to, to the best of our ability to, to, to help them make decisions. And, and I would rather our folks not, if, if the test is not valuable, if it's not going to help us diagnose or do something, let's move away from them. Because I think, I think sometimes in schools we have legacies of old programs and, and people feel comfortable testing. And, and the question is, 
we probably need to move away from some of that and only test kids when we truly need to test them and we have a, a certain purpose. And I think that'll keep teachers from being overwhelmed. For teaching purposes, we're going to have to shut down in a moment. I want to thank uh, Hollis Milton, superintendent from West Feliciana Schools, for making the drive and inspiring us. And Dr. Pat Cooper, thank you for joining us for the last few minutes. If any of you